working to save that which was lost. Amen. He came to reclaim what the devil has taken, what he has stolen. When I look at your neighbor and tell him it's not over yet. Amen. Not many accounts in Scripture better give us an understanding how God's able to restore and how God's able to revive than that what we see in Ezekiel's vision and in that valley. Everybody say in the valley. It wasn't on a mountaintop. It was in a valley. Amen. And God's still able to restore people in the valley. Amen. You ever walk through a valley? Uh, I'll just be honest with you. The valley has more beauty than the mountain. I mean, the mountain, it, it looks cool, you know, from a distance. But when you get up close to it, the mountain is just a bunch of rock. It's not, unless you're into rocks or something, I mean, it's not a lot of beauty in a rock. I mean, it's just a, just a hard surface. Just a rock. Amen? But in this valley... If I think of a valley, I'm thinking of a, a beautiful place. But if we read the scripture, we think of this valley that is equal to seeing. Uh, imagine with me that beautiful valley that, that you may be walking through or that maybe you were envisioning whatever I thought when you when I asked you to think about a valley. Maybe think about uh, what, what is it that, that you like about that valley. And all of a sudden you're walking in that beautiful place and you walk upon a group of dead, dry bones. The valley's not so beautiful anymore. That peaceful walk that you were on is not so peaceful anymore. That setting that was so awesome just a moment earlier is now something that's not so exciting. I mean, regardless of all the other beauty that's around, now that you have seen that deadness in the valley, what you once thought was beautiful is no longer beautiful. And the reality is it is impossible, everybody say it's impossible, to ignore dry bones. Regardless of where you are, uh, you can be in the most beautiful place out in Colorado. But if you walk up on a skeleton, you're going to give some attention to it. Uh, the flowers don't mean much anymore. The landscape doesn't mean much anymore. It's now all about the bones. And that's Ezekiel. He's, he's up on that moment, and these dry bones, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're distracting. And here God tells them, and so just coming up on these dry bones, this is the most depressing thing about the whole day. God tells Ezekiel, hey, Ezekiel, those dry bones you just came up on in this valley, they represent Israel. They represent my people. They represent this nation who, who already feels like they don't have any hope. It represents this person that, that already feels like that the world is crashing in on them. And by the way, Ezekiel, these bones represent that people. These people that are being held captive every turn around that they get to. There, there's all of a sudden there's armies that's coming against them. And, and they, they just don't see how they can ever see any light at the end of the tunnel. They, they've got to have this feeling as if it's over. we got to be careful, church, that we don't allow feelings to get into our minds no matter what situations may come our way because Solomon said a merry heart does good like a medicine, and we often quote that, but he also said a broken spirit drieth the bone. Amen. Regardless of what comes against us, we cannot allow our spirits to be broken. We cannot allow our faith to be broken. We cannot allow our walk with God to be dried up. We've got to stand firm on the word of God and know that a merry heart doth good like a medicine. But we also need to guard against a broken spirit. I may be sick in my body, but my spirit cannot be broken. I may have weakness in my physical body, but my spiritual body cannot be broken. I've got to make sure that I keep strength in my walk with God. I've got to make sure that I put power. We've got to partake in the power of God. We talked about Sunday. 
Because a broken spirit drieth the bone. A broken spirit dries the bones. It affects you deep. And few things are more depressing than a broken spirit. When the spirit's broken, your faith dries up. When your spirit's broken, your hope dries up. When your spirit's broken, your worship dries up. When your spirit's broken, your faithfulness dries up. And for Israel, even Ezekiel, just the belief that things would get better seemed like that would just be a foolish belief because it was so bad. You ever been in a place so bad in life where you just felt like it'd be foolish to even think it's going to get better? That's got to be what Ezekiel and the people of Israel, that has to be what they were thinking. They just believed it was over for them. And in this valley was a place that Ezekiel had to face every doubt. Life will put you in a place. I forget. I, I think it might have been, uh, was it you, Brother Eric, was talking about help my unbelief the other day? Who was that doing a ministry minute? Brother Tyler. Talking about help my unbelief. Amen. There's, get there, you better rest assured in your life and in your walk with God. You're going to face situations that cause you to come face to face with the doubt that is present in your life. It may be a diagnosis. It may be the news, a phone call that you don't want to get. It may be a family situation. But you're going to come face to face with an opportunity to come and know exactly what the doubt is that's in your life. There's unbelief in all of us. Oh, say, Pastor, you shouldn't say it like that. The reality is it's because it's part of our flesh. And all of us have flesh. Amen. If you bet, there's going to be an opportunity in our life where we're going to come face to face with an, with an opportunity to see the doubt and the unbelief that's part of our life. That's why it's ever more important that we stay full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That we walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. And so in this place that Ezekiel had to face his doubts. And what, do we, what will he do? What will we do whenever we come face to face with doubt in our life? Is he going to just believe what he sees? Or it's just a bunch of dry bones. It's just a bunch of people that ain't moving. A bunch of people that are just. Or will he trust that it's not over yet? Because I have a God that's done put me where I am. Amen. God didn't try to hide anything from Ezekiel. God's not going to try to hide anything from us. It was as if God brought Ezekiel to the valley in the first place. What are you saying, Pastor? God's got you where he's got you in the first place. Amen. It's not just by happen chance. God has you right where he's got you, and you are facing what you're facing, not by an accident. God is still in control. As a country, we're not facing what we're facing by accident. God has us right where he wants us for such a time as this. And God didn't sugarcoat it for his equal, and God doesn't sugarcoat it for us. He just says, here's a, here's a tour, Ezekiel. This is... Israel, leg bone not connected to the hip bone, hip bone not connected to the, the bones wouldn't, con they were just scattered, dry, disconnected. And Ezekiel was looking across all these bones and he says, lo, they're very dry. No flesh visible. Already been picked apart by the vultures in the area. Clean, dry bones. Just there. And their condition causes Ezekiel to question. In Ezekiel 37 and 3, uh, 
whenever God asked him, can these bones live? He said, uh, Lord, you know, Lord, um, uh, what are you saying? I'm saying he was face to face with that doubt. Can so and so still get the Holy Ghost? Can so and so still be restored? I know that they took advantage of this opportunity and they and they left on that and they, they took advantage of that opportunity that God gave. Can they still be restored? Can these bones live, church? Uh Lord, you know. And we say things, Lord, if it's your will, as if to put all the pressure off of our faith, that God is truly able to take anybody from any situation. Oh, Lord, God, you know, and every one of us has faced, or possibly some may be here tonight, or some may be watching, and you are currently facing something similar with the battle of the doubt and the unbelief and all the questions inside of you. And sometimes, let's just be honest, sometimes things do appear hopeless. I'm not trying to be negative tonight. I'm just trying to be real. I want to talk to you tonight. I want to minister to you tonight. Because then God asks a question that makes us question, can this relationship, can this faith truly be healed? Can, can my worship truly be in spirit and in truth again? Will our backslidden people that have fallen away from God that are part or once were a part of this church, can they truly come back home? Can our failing marriage really be fixed? Just real stuff. Lord, <laughs> I want to encourage you tonight. I know it's Wednesday night, but I want to encourage you. It's not over yet. Yeah. I mean, I look around. Somebody said, look at these empty seats. I look, I know it's midweek, and we don't expect a big crowd on Wednesday night, but I want us to change that. I mean, Wednesday night ought to be a time. I, we say it, midweek still matters. We still need to be faithful to the house of God. And it shouldn't be any easier to find an excuse on a Wednesday just because it's midweek. Amen. Man, I want to encourage you. Somebody say it's not over yet. Amen. He, he brought me, he, he, on a Wednesday night, he brought me to a valley, maybe of drought. I'm not talking, I'm preaching to the choir tonight. Amen. But somebody may be watching tonight, and I'm trying to encourage you. Amen. God wants me to let you know tonight that it's not over yet. God wants you to know it's not over yet. Your marriage isn't over yet. You're, it's not over yet. What's dead is going to live again. He's stolen what was precious. But Jesus is the restorer. Amen. God gave Ezekiel a lot of different commands in his ministry. And all of a sudden, on this day, another unusual assignment. Ezekiel, I want you to preach to those dead bones, dry bones. I want you to preach to them. And this afternoon... I was working on this message, and the Lord said, I want you to preach on a Wednesday night. Amen. I don't want you to teach tonight. I want you to go, and I want you to preach tonight. Amen. That it's not over yet. And then I'm sitting in my office, and it's about 15 till, and I started not feeling it. It's not COVID-related symptoms, so nobody started. Oh, has he got COVID? It's not my body. I don't know what it is. It's just one of them things. But amen. It's not over yet. Amen. And so God provided Ezekiel with a sermon to preach. And I believe he's provided me with a sermon to preach tonight. He told him, he said, you preach to those bones, ye shall live. I've come to preach to you tonight. It's not over yet. I've come to preach to that dead, dry faith that you've been carrying around. And you've been lugging around like some dead weight. It's going to live again because it's not over yet. may not make sense to and I'm okay with that. But if there's just one person that you've come in and you felt like it was all hopeless, I've come to preach to you tonight that it's not over yet. Don't you dare throw in the towel just yet. Because God, if God be for you, who can be against you? The thief wants to steal. 
the faith from our hearts. He wants to steal the word of God out of the mouth of the people of God, out of the mouth of the preacher. But I'm sorry, it's not over yet. Don't lose your neighbor say it's not over yet. And I appreciate y'all responding tonight, but I, there can't be no more unresponsive congregation than a valley full of drive <laughs> Amen. Well, <laughs> that'd be pretty bad right there. And that's who Jesus sent Ezekiel to. But as Ezekiel obeyed and declared the message that God told him to declare, something supernatural happened. So on a Wednesday night, I'm going to declare what the Lord laid on my heart to declare to you because I want to see something supernatural happen. <laughs> Amen. I want to just tell you, it's not over yet. Amen. Don't throw in the towel just yet. It's easy to imagine Ezekiel just temporarily, just as he's looking at all this. And, oh, Ezekiel, I want you to preach to these dry bones. I want you to talk to them. I want you to preach. You're going to live. And I could just imagine that little stutter. Just all of a sudden going speechless. And then he began to preach what the Lord told him to preach. And as he began to preach what the Lord told him to preach to so those dry bones. And that dead congregation responded with a little noise and a little shaking. Probably not what Ezekiel was expecting. He might have just thought this was another test. Another crazy assignment God's got him on. And then all of a sudden what was dead and what was lifeless began to. Make a little noise. And I can imagine as he began to watch those bones come together and muscles and the flesh begin to come around those bones and that skin covered the bodies. Ezekiel had to begin to get excited right then. And, and his preaching had been followed by a demonstration of the power of God. There's always a demonstration whenever there's a response to the preaching. Amen. 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 The results of Ezekiel's preaching, it was, a, it was a foreshadowing of what Paul said in Ephesians 4. And that he, when God was talking, he said that this whole body would be fitly joined together. We are one body. And we are fitly joined together. And we are compacted by every joint. And there's not, I've told us this last week, we can't have just and say, I don't need any part of the body. We need each other. Amen. I can't say I don't need you and you can't say you don't need me. We are part of this body. But there can be no healing and there can be no restoration and there can be no supernatural move of the Holy Ghost until all the individual members come together in unity. I'm going to say that again. There can be no supernatural work of God and there can be no, the will of God is not going to be done the way he wants to do it until all individual Work together in unity. Everybody say unity. And sometimes the body of Christ needs a miracle similar to what Ezekiel happened in the valley. We got marriage conference coming up this weekend. Amen. And I'll just, it's no secret. Amen. There are this many couples in a church. There's going to be some that's got some problems. Well. And I've been pushing this marriage conference for weeks now. And we got 23 couples I think is going to be here. We give God praise for that. Amen. But we got more 23 couples a part of our church. And it can't be a money problem is the reason why some ain't coming. Because we've already said we're going to cover it. And some people's already paid for other people. Oh, it's quiet now. I guess the other 30 or so, 40 couples done got it figured out. Well, uh, this mic went so expensive. I'd <laughs> Y'all so crazy. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes we need what Ezekiel saw. We're some dead, dry stuff. Some dead, dry people. People that separated from the life and 
It's no, no longer a part of where they are. It needs to all come back together again. There needs to be some unity in some places. There's not unity right now in the body of Christ. And there needs to be some coming together. It doesn't matter how long you've been dry. It doesn't matter how long you haven't worshipped like you know God wants you to worship. It doesn't matter how long you've been unfaithful when you know God wants you to be faithful. It doesn't matter how long you've been seeking the Holy Ghost and you've been thinking that God isn't going to give it to you. You need to know it's not over yet. Let some boldness get in you on a Wednesday night and just declare it's not over yet. Ezekiel preached. And yet, even though the noise was being made, the restoration wasn't complete just yet. God could have immediately done it, but it's a process. They wasn't immediately this big army. It was just some bones coming together, just some skin covering some stuff. These bones come together. Get this now. It's a valley full of dead, dry bones. Bones come together. They're making noise. They're moving. But they're still dead. Still moving. Oh. They're not disconnected anymore. But they're still dead. Don't mistake your connection with the church being all that you need in God. Because just because you're connected doesn't mean that the life that God has promised you is living on the inside of you. You can be connected to a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that it lives in you. Amen. I want to be more than just connected to the church. Amen. I want the spirit of the Lord to live inside of me. I want the spirit of my bridegroom to live inside of me. They were connected, but they were still dead. Okay. What are you saying? Is that God had a work to do, but it didn't all happen at one time. Sometimes it's a process. Process. I must say process. We can't forsake the process, and we can't get upset at the process. These bones, they join together, but they're still dead. God has a process. He didn't just do it all at one time, and that's where we get frustrated. But sometimes a second touch, everybody says second touch, is required before the restoration that God truly has is complete. Amen. What are you saying? I'm thankful for what God did Sunday morning. I'm thankful for what God did Sunday night. Amen. But don't just be satisfied with that because what God really wants to do isn't complete yet. And that's where a lot of people mess up. Some people come to church and get the Holy Ghost and then you won't see them again. I got all I want of me. It's just like getting the body work done in the bondo on a good old classic. Just happy it's not all rusted out with holes in it anymore. Amen. But God has a paint booth. That he wants to change some stuff. And he wants to He wants to really let some things shine in you. And he wants to. Amen. What are you saying, Pastor? I want to say don't get discouraged when God's work in you seems to be unfinished. Don't be discouraged when God's work in the church seems to be unfinished. I know I can. Amen. Amen. Because God doesn't always instantly restore the dry bones in our life. He wants us to walk with him in obedience. If I get the body work done and all the sand and all that, and then I just leave the shop, the paint booth don't come to my house. It's a lot of work that went into that paint booth. There's a lot of behind the scenes that goes into a good paint booth. 
Amen. There's a lot of stuff that God has. There's a foundation that's been laid from the foundation of the world. That, that there's a truth that God has for his people. The promises God has for his people. We can't just leave the church and we can't just walk away from walking with God when we just get a little touch from God. Amen. We got to be obedient. Everybody say obedient. We got to walk in obedience. We can't just quit. We've got to keep praying. We've got to con continue speaking the promises of God over our life and over our homes, over our family. We've got to position ourselves. Y'all hear me talk about this a lot. We've got to position ourselves in a place where we can be obedient and hear the voice of God. We got to do that. Everybody say it's not over yet. Ezekiel was amazed by what God had done in restoring these bones and the bodies, but he couldn't overlook that important reality. He said in Ezekiel 37 and verse 8, he said, there was no breath in them. They're dead. They're now connected bones, but there's no breath in them. There's no life in them. And he's like this, even though it's a, it's a whole body now this dead corpse is no better than a valley full of dry bones I mean really what's the difference it just it doesn't look so decomposed anymore it looks more normal but it's still dead I think I'll just say that again it looks more normal but it's still dead that's why we got to be careful in the apostolic church that we don't get so caught up in trying to look normal again and trying to just look a certain way. And we got to make sure that we got the spirit of the Lord and the power of the Lord activated and actively working in our lives and in our services. Because we can make it look more normal and still be dead. Uh, somebody say it's not over yet. This dead corpse, as Ezekiel was seeing, he's like, it's no better than what I had before. Had a little of excitement when the bones were moving around, but now this is still a dead corpse. But somebody say it's not over. The miracle wasn't finished yet. God wasn't finished yet. Could you imagine with me in creation when God's creating everything and he's speaking things into existence out of nowhere? What if he had stopped at day number five? Beautiful creation. And if you're a bird and a fish, you might be excited by that. But since you're a man or woman, a man, human, without day six, you wouldn't be here. I'm thankful he was able to keep going because there was nothing there to stand in his way. Say, Pastor, God can do whatever he wants to do when he wants to do it. That's true, except for when it concerns you and me, we have to allow him access. We have to allow him permission to do the work that he wants to do in us. The dog may have to bark, and the cat may, may have to I almost said the cat may have to moo, but that, that wouldn't have sounded too good. The cat has to meow. But we don't have to praise him, and we don't have to be obedient to him. We don't have to be faithful to him. Even though he's not finished, we can push him away from working on us. And he, we can even let him have the time to put us all back together and remain a dead corpse, being satisfied that we're no longer a bunch of group of dry bones and just because we're together feel like it's all good now when God said there's still life I have that I want to give to you. As they come back to the music.
Ezekiel 37, verse 9, prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain, that they may live. What are you saying? We have to keep proclaiming the promises of God. We have to keep talking about revival. We have to keep proclaiming revival. We have to keep believing for the backslider to come home. We have to keep praying for the backslider. Somebody say, it's not over yet. I can only imagine the foolishness that Ezekiel had to feel as he was prophesying to some dead bones. But I'm so thankful he prophesied to the dry bones. Because now I can preach to you tonight. It's not over yet. As he was prophesying to those bones, he began to speak to the wind. Anybody else remember the wind being talked about in Scripture? Ezekiel 37 and 14, he said this. He said, I shall put my spirit in you. You shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. We can learn something important from this, and that's that God still cares about people that are far away from him. And if God still cares about them, then I want to make sure that I still care about them. If he still cares about those that are far off, last I checked, that promise that we read about, and we also often quote in Acts 2.38, about the Holy Ghost. He said in 39, he said that the promise is unto you, to your children, all that are far off. So we're thankful it's for us. We're thankful it's for our kids. But he said it's also for those that are far off. So if he still cares about them, then I want to make sure I still care about them. Ephesians 2.13 says, Now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. He goes on later in verse 18, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. He gives us access. It's not over yet. As we all stand. That vision that Ezekiel had. That wind that revived an army, restored hope to a nation, kind of reminds of a wind that Jesus talked about with Nicodemus. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but can't tell where it comes from and where there it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. It's a wind. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. He gave them utterance. Was holy. And that small group of people that came out of the upper room, that prayer meeting, began the work that God had put into them to do by really following after an example that was set by Ezekiel in a valley full of dry bones. What was they doing? They, they left that prayer meeting proclaiming the word of God to a lost nation. Ezekiel was in a valley of a lost nation, but he began to proclaim the word of God. And what was dead, dry, lost, Received life. Somebody say it's not over yet. That same wind continues to blow today. And I'm thankful. Because the Holy Ghost still restores dead, dry bones. The Holy Ghost still picks people up that feel like that there is no hope. And the Holy Ghost still gives hope to them. And the day of Pentecost is something that still applies to us today. The wind... Holy Ghost wind doesn't know any boundaries. There's no windbreaker that's going to stop 
the wind of the Spirit of God from gaining access to those that want to know Him in the power of His resurrection. I'll close with this. That vision that he had of a valley of dry bones can still minister to us today because of all the emotions that had to be there. Hopelessness, despair, dependency, shattered dreams. Overwhelmed the people of God and we continue to wear these little masks and everything's okay. It's not over yet. The greatest three words that we could ever understand. Somebody say, it's not over yet. The greatest three words that we could ever understand. Oh, four. I said what I meant to say. It's not over yet. The greatest three words that we could ever understand. It's not over. It's not that yet goes away. But just because it's somebody wrote a song. Uh, He's never failed me yet. He's never failed me yet. Jesus Christ has never failed me yet. I'll never forget one time, Brother Hill, he was, they, the praise team was singing that song in Tupelo, and he gets up there and he says, stop it. He said, I don't mind y'all singing that song, but y'all got to take that word yet out of there. True story. So what he was saying was, is because you're introducing an opportunity for doubt. As if, there's a possibility that he could fail. It's not over yet. The greatest three words that we could understand. It's not over. I'm glad God keeps his promises. He said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more. Abundantly, I know that there may be valleys full of dead, dry bones, and there may be situations in your life that's caused you to dry up, Then I'm not dismissing that. But I am here to tell you tonight that it's not over yet. The greatest three words that you could ever get into your walk with God, it's not over. You got to have that ability in you, a boldness in you to declare to the thief of your soul, the thief of your joy, the thief of your happiness in God, the thief of your faithfulness in God, the thief of the salvation that God has placed over your life. Amen. You need to let him know it's not over. Rejoice not against me, O oh, my enemy, when I fall, because it's not over. I shall arise. God's just looking for somebody with some boldness tonight that's bold enough to declare it's not over. Again, if it's not, this may not be for everybody. Why, Pastor, why are you preaching on Wednesday night? I'm just trying to obey God tonight. Amen. But I'm telling you, if it's just one person that you were on the brink of trying to give up, I've come to tell you tonight what Ezekiel tried to preach to those dry bones. He said, you're going to live. God sent me here to tell you tonight it's not over. You need to declare it to the enemy of your soul. It's not over. And I'm telling you, if you'll act on the boldness and act upon the word of God tonight, God's going to give you some faith like you've never had before. If you're bold enough, I want to open up these altars on a Wednesday night for somebody to step out. If you're watching and I'm talking to you tonight, amen, I encourage you, let this be more than just something you tune or you turn off. You need to 